Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. We are talking about nine marks. We're doing part 2C. So we're trying to do the second mark, which is what they call biblical theology. And as we've been pointing out with their first two points that we've covered so far, it is anything but biblical, as we've demonstrated with their own words. Okay, And it's going to get even more fun during this time. Um, since we always have Calvinists listening to the channel, and they, we have new Calvinists listening since we're dealing with nine marks and Calvinist issues, I need to issue my nine marks, uh, well, my, my Calvinist disclaimer for our Calvinist friends out there. You need to understand before you comment, please, okay, so it doesn't waste our time that Beyond the Fundamentals does not promote or agree with Arminianism, Provisionism, Pelagianism, Universalism, Synergism, Monergism, Open Theism, or any other ideological label to which Calvinists attempt to match their theological opponents. We also do not hold free will as an axiomatic premise, nor do we worship ourselves or think that we save ourselves. We completely support biblical predestination and biblical election while rejecting Augustinian and Gnostic perversions of these concepts. Now that we have that out of the way, if you like what you're getting on this channel, we invite you to support the channel in any way that you can, financially if you want to. Uh, one day, we're going to be able to produce a lot more content. We're headed in that direction. Also, you can support by liking us on Facebook, following us there, like these videos, subscribe to them, and share them with people who could use this kind of content. This is Part 2C, which means there has been a Part 1, a Part 2A, and a Part 2B. So... I'm not going to talk a lot about these things, but just in case it's your first time, you need to understand Goodhart's Law, the nine marks of exp expositional preaching, the nine marks that Mark Dever made up out of thin air of a good church, okay? Expositional preaching, biblical theology, the gospel, etc. and so forth. They violate Goodhart's Law because we find out that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. For example, if you want gross domestic product you're going to the best way to get that is for war slavery and addiction if you want to have a great restaurant the best way to have a good restaurant is to maximize on the idea of addiction and wind up with sugar salt and fat and produce diabetes heart disease and obesity but you're going to be the number one restaurant okay so we talk about what we call yellow teaming how we don't want to have uh unintended consequences uh when we're optimizing for a narrow scope this usually what we do, left hemisphere, our scope of projects and progress is too narrowly defined. And we externalize a bunch of harm to the environmental commons and the information ecology that uh, we don't go around and clean back up. Okay, We're using multiple developmental models that we've talked about multiple times on the channel. We have videos about all of these. Also got a book that I'm working on dealing with all of these growth models that we've talked about. This is, this is the one we used when we talked about uh, what Tyler Vela was overlooking when he left Christianity. And had he know the, known these things and transcended the ego a little bit, he might have stayed in Christianity. Okay, So there's a lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. There's, there's typically not a version of Christianity which goes beyond stage three. And when people come to that place, like Tyler Vela or Derek Webb or Paul Maxwell or... Uh, Joseph Solomon or Josh Harris or any of these people, they, they're they ready to go past stage three, but there isn't any church for them to facilitate them going past stage three, and they think they need to learn Christianity, uh, leave Christianity, which arguably they have not yet experienced. Mammon Church, everything on the bottom side, everything uh, in a Calvinist or Provisionist church is down here on the bottom side. That's not where we want to be. We want to be up here. We talked about moral foundations theory and the four kinds of knowing and how the nine marks system, Calvinism, provisionism, it all magnifies just propositional knowing without referring to any of the real kinds of knowing, which is the exact same kind of thing as having a whole bunch of money, but nothing that it can buy. Okay, If you had a bunch of monopoly money, or if you're in Venezuela after the Bolshevik Revolution, if you had a bunch of the old currency, they put it bunch of currency and wheelbarrows just to buy a loaf of bread, okay? That's what's happening when people are puffed up with propositional knowledge without any of the real kinds of knowing. That's what the Bible talks about. Be your knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. It's this kind of knowledge, okay? The Bible tells you to get knowledge. 
And the kind of knowledge you're supposed to get is this kind. When you don't have this kind of knowledge, you get hung up on this kind. And that why, that's why they think everything has to be worded just right because they can't see clearly. And we have videos on seeing clearly, which we highly recommend that you watch when you get a chance. In addition to the futility of systematic theology, any systematic theology, and belief is not what you think. Okay? So there's a lot of information going into what we're presenting here. Uh, we like to emphasize the I am the way component of following Jesus rather than a list of beliefs that's important in the disposition that we are coming from. And one of our problems with nine marks is that it makes the church big and the person small. Why have nine marks of a healthy church? Why not have nine marks of a wise person or of a growing person or of a transformed person? Okay. The problem is church stuff scales well. You can teach propositions, you can fill people's heads with it, and you can get people to replicate that at a mass scale. You can send hundreds and thousands of people to seminary, put them in Sunday school classes, and get them to repeat the things, okay? But to actually graduate from the school of the Count of Monte Cristo is a, an entirely different matter. It is guildcraft teaching. It is apprenticeship. It is not easy. It doesn't scale well. And the problem with the stage three church today is that there are no wise elders to lead people along in how to be a wise person themselves. In chapter two, biblical theology, we've already covered the God of the Bible is a creating God and the God of the Bible is a holy God. What we're going to attempt to do today in this live session is uh, sessions, sections three, four, and five. The God of the Bible is a faithful God. The God of the Bible is a loving God. The God of the Bible is a sovereign God. And need I remind you that this all comes from the person who created and recommends at the end of this chapter a six-week study on how you can know the whole truth about God, biblical theology, a six-week inductive Bible study from nine, from nine marks. And that is, uh, that's just about the most profane thing anybody could possibly say. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The way the Greeks said it back in the day was that awe and wonder is the beginning of wisdom. And we're talking about the kind of awe and wonder that results in horror. Yes, horror. And another way to say this is like absolute humility. Okay? The kind of fear, awe, wonder, and horror that leaves you in absolute humility. Nobody who had any taste of humility whatsoever would make a six-week inductive Bible study called The Whole Truth About God. Just wouldn't happen. Okay? So we're dealing with absolutely profane people to start with. In our past sessions, we also talked about the basic scaffolding worldview of salvation that all the evangelicals hold. Doesn't matter whether you're Assemblies of God, Baptist, Presbyterian, Calvinist, Provisionist, whatever. These are all the things that they have in common. And these are premises that are accepted on face value intuitively without ever being called into question, without realizing that maybe the Bible isn't talking about this model of things, okay? So here at Beyond the Fundamentals, we are actually talking about uh, questioning this model of things. Maybe this isn't how things go, and in our previous videos, we talk about that more in depth. So we have uh, the highlight from big thing about yesterday is we took a timeline of the Bible and we laid it out over a spiral dynamics chart or under a spiral dynamics chart or an integral theory chart, however you want to say it. And another way of saying this, if you're familiar with the work of Michael Heiser, when Michael Heiser says you need to understand the culture of the people at that day and time in order to understand what's being said, this is another way to say that in a roundabout kind of way. What we're doing basically is we're taking all the developmental models that we can get our hands on, and there are more. There's actually one that has 12 steps in it. Not, it's not a 12-step program. It's 12 stages of growth. All right, not to be confused with that, that I haven't read yet, that I'm interested in reading. But it's, it's important to incorporate all of these to the, to the degree that we can. Uh, last time we were together, we finished up the God of the Bible is a holy God. What we're doing was we're simply going through the nine marks book. We're reading paragraphs that stood out to me. And then I'm commenting on them and saying what I think they're overlooking or what I think is wrong with them. Chandler Farley in the chat says, question, is there any model beneficial? Like beneficial to what? Like they say in physics, um, all models, all models 
all models are false, some are useful. And that's pretty much the best way to look at everything, especially when you consider Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which we covered in session one of this. Gödel's incompleteness theorem. If you can't have a complete theory when it comes to mathematics, you, why would you think you could have one when it comes to an infinite God? I mean, how, how obtuse can we possibly be? Okay, so when it comes to models, the idea is that all models are wrong, some are useful. For example, the Newtonian model of physics is wrong. It doesn't, it, it doesn't account for relativity. It does not account for uh, quantum physics, both of which we can demonstrate to have some, some signal to those theories. However, it was useful enough to get to the moon, okay? So it's wrong in that it is not fully complete <clears throat> and the timing of a, cer of a few certain things is, is a hair off because they don't account for relativity. <clears throat> but it's very useful to get to the moon, supposing you're one of the people that believes we got to the moon. Okay, you can put something in orbit using Newtonian physics, but it's not true with a capital T. The, the atomic clock uses a cesium-133 atom, which is supposed to vibrate at the speed of light, which is a dumb idea, in my opinion, because there's controversy from Andrew Setterfield's work over whether or not the speed of light is a constant or not. And if it is speeding up or slowing down, and you're measuring the speed of light using something that vibrates at the speed of light, what you have is a rubber ruler. Okay? Nonetheless, they put an atomic clock with a cesium-133 atom in it, uh, on the earth and they flew another one in the plane around these are supposed to be absolutely synchronized they flew put another one in a plane and flew it around the earth and when it came back they were microseconds different because of the separation even though they had been together for years so we can demonstrate relativity even just in an airplane <clears throat> It's worse than six weeks, somebody says, one day says. They are now pushing 27-month Sunday school program. Check out what Dever is peddling on the Nine Marks YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah, we could get into all of these, but I'd never get through the content that I have for today. There's a good question. We ought to have a Q&A session one day, one day when we're older. So we're going to leave... Uh, the God of the Bible is a holy God. We're getting now into the section. The God of the Bible is a faithful God. And the place of the book that we're starting on now is in my copy. I have the Kindle version. Kindle, Kindle location 999. His comment is, in Exodus 34, 6 through 7, the Lord says the most amazing thing to Moses, especially given that God is the creator, great creator who made the world and that our sin is, then caused a rupture in his creation. First of all, to say our sin caused a rupture in his creation is a strange thing. This, this pronoun here is strange. And then for us, or the creation at all, to be able to cause a rupture in God's creation kind of flies all in the face of what somebody might call like a hard deterministic sovereign God. How, how could there be a rupture in that? How sovereign could a God be where sin could disrupt his creation or, or have a rupture? So this is a typical ideological inconsistency. Our sin, Romans 5, 12 talks about wherefore by the sin of one man, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all of sin. One man, not our sin. Rupture, how sovereign could a being be whose creatures have the power to rupture his creation? So it's a performative contradiction right there in the Calvinist's own writings. So the next section we're reading from him, and this is kind of a lengthy session. Consider God's passion for holiness and how that fits with the following passage when the Lord reveals himself in his character. And this is quoting from the book of uh, Exodus, I believe. I thought I had the reference on here, and I'm sure I do somewhere. The Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, the compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. How can the last couple of phrases fit together? The Lord is abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin, and yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. So 
I think it was supposed to be like this. This is his, his, he's quoting a passage here. And then he's coming down here and commenting on it himself. To understand the God of the Bible, we have to understand this passage. This is the promise of hope from the redemption of God's people. The biblical picture of the Lord is not of an uncaring of grim condemnation. God is not only holy and just in his wavering, in his unwavering commitment to oppose and punish sin, he is also faithful to his promises. Throughout history, God planned and promised to reveal his glory to his people, and he did, but how could the Lord forgive wickedness and yet not leave the guilty unpunished? The answer to that mystery wasn't found in, the, in these Israelites, but in God and his promise particularly, and in his promised person, the Old Testament hope required an atoning sacrifice, a propitiation to assuage the righteous wrath of God. Hope required a substitution of suffering and death on the part of the innocent for the deserved punishment of the guilty. And it would seem that hope required some relationship between the offerer and the victim. So all this transactional stuff, we commented a lot on that in the last video. And one comment I said, I think we said it about three times, was that the purpose of Christ's death was not to change God's mind about us. It was to change our mind about God. I highly recommend that people read Rene Girard's Scapegoat Theory whenever you get a chance. So... My comment here is that similar things could be said of water. Water is life-giving, life-sustaining. It provides everything from easy navigation to cleanliness to fun. It's a universal solvent. But water will also unmercifully have its way if it is not interacted with appropriately. Interacted with appropriately. It can wash away towns, sink ships, drown grown men and babies, and crush people in an instant. Okay, And you could also say this. I'm going to add a sentence here. Water loves those who drink it. Water hates those who breathe it. Okay. Now, does water actually have a will that it's exercising on behalf of the people who are interacting with it in that way? Does it? Doesn't work that way, okay? But water loves those who drink it. Water hates those who breathe it. Something similar going on with God. It depends on how you interact with God. Depends on what you get. And I highly encourage people to look into Alfred North Whitehead Process Theology. Read some Ian McGillcrest. And when I recommend these, when I recommend these different sources. The way you read things, left hemispheric, stage three, first tier consciousness, you're thinking of adding information to your head. I'm going to add new information to my head. But there comes a point in time when the stuff that you read and the stuff that helps you, actually, instead of adding information to your head, it actually peels away some of the bad thoughts and bad premises that you had and didn't know you had and gets back down to something simpler, something very simpler that's very much related to what you experience as a baby, okay? So I'm trying to peel back, when I recommend some of these writings, I'm trying to help you peel back some of the bad parts of your enculturation cocoon, cocoon that you need to climb out of if you're ever going to transform into a butterfly, okay? And if you think when I'm recommending these sources that I'm, I'm trying to indoctrinate you with new ideas that you add to what you know, that's not how the process works. It is a completely different thing, okay? So this, speaking of all this right here, this could also be said of the future or of a resourceful but unexplored territory, okay? An unexplored territory can provide food, water, and shelter, and it can kill you. The future can provide food, water, and shelter, or it can kill you, okay? There's lots of similarities with these things in God. It's very limiting to have a modified Zeus model of God, like Dever has, and such should be avoided at all costs. The Bible is a practicum in how to deal with reality. So we're on slide 87. When I talk about the Zeus model of God, this is part of the standard worldview of evangelicals, Calvinists, provisionists, Arminians, etc. and so forth. They all have a modified Zeus model concept of God, the man upstairs, uh, slightly grown up version of Santa Claus. And really not much different. The God of the Bible is a faithful God. So he says, 
his comments, I'm starting here reading from his book again, in chapter 2. In the time of Christ, people were not wondering whether a Messiah would come, they took it for granted. The early chapters of each of the Gospels show that people were looking for a Messiah, for the anointed one that the Lord had promised would come. The Lord had said through Moses that he would raise up a prophet, see Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19, but when this prophet came, he took everyone by surprise because he, Jesus, fulfilled not just the kingly prophecies of the Messiah, which most people were quite comfortable with, but also, and I don't like that when they end a sentence or a phrase with a preposition, he should have said, with which most people were quite comfortable. Preposition, not proposition, different thing. But also, sixth grade grammar, but also the prophecies about the suffering Messiah who would be rejected and suffer in the place of his people. Now, taking the tone from his people, we see that he is narcissizing the text. Dever is not missing any opportunity to reinforce the Calvinistic election trope when he says his people. He also he doesn't take it out of the he doesn't take it in context. He tries to refer that to himself. In the comment section, Roddy is saying Hebraic Megazeus. That's that's pretty much exactly right. As a matter of fact, the word we have for God, Theos, in the Greek, is is the Greek word for the Latin Zeus. Same thing. Um, Calvinists love to cite this passage and narcissistically read themselves into his people. You say, what does narcissistically mean? Well, typically you would say exegetically or eisegetically. Exegetically is to draw the meaning out of the text. Eisegetically is to impose the meaning onto the text, which is not what you want to do. And then narcissistically is to always see yourself in the text. And that's what Calvinists are constantly doing. They exalt themselves with everything that they do, every step they take. So they're reading themselves into his people, and they will quote a passage like Matthew one twenty one, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And they're like, ah. That's me. That's me. I'm his people. But they seem to struggle to keep reading to see who his people are. If they would just keep reading past the chapter break, and I think that the work that Stephen Langdon did when he helped separate the Bible into chapters and verses uh, resulted in this negative artifact of Calvinism coming out, left hemispheric thing that slices everything into small little particles and can't see the context. In the very same context, Matthew 2, 6. And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come out governor that shall rule my people Israel. The his people here is Israel, okay? Pretty sure Deborah is not a Hebrew, okay? My people Israel, All right? Hebrew Jews. Jew is the religion Hebrew is the ethnicity. Hebrews are named after Eber, Genesis 10 and 11. Eber. Abraham was a descendant of Eber, and the descendants of Eber are called Eberus, Hebrews. That's where Hebrews comes from. Descendants of Eber from Genesis 10 and 11. My people Israel are the descendants of Eber who got the promised land that went to Abraham. I do not think that Dever is an Eberu. This is the same Matthew 2, 6, that shall rule my people Israel. Now, this is the same his people that reject their Messiah. In John 1, 11, it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now, let me ask you a question, Calvinist. If they were his own, okay, in what way were they his own, if they didn't receive him, I thought the sheep hear his voice. And I know you're over there yelling at the screen saying, they're not all in Israel who are of Israel. Da, 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 da. I know, I know. I'm just telling you, everything you think is wrong. That's what I'm telling you. Okay, so stop thinking it. Notice this is the same his people that are hardened in Romans 9. And yes, Romans 9 is about the elect people of Israel being Hardened and blinded, Romans chapter 11, has nothing to do with any Gentiles not receiving Christ, sit next to you in church on Sunday and don't go down the aisle to receive Christ. Romans 9 is not the answer for that, okay? Romans 9 is why Jews in the first century who rejected Jesus as the Messiah were hardened and blinded. That's all it's about. That's all it's ever been about. 
Romans 9, 18, therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth. And by the way, we can stop right there just for a second since we're doing this and show that this is another place where Calvinists just seem to fail to be able to keep reading because if you keep going to Romans chapter 11, verse 32, in the same overall pericope of the three chapters, Romans 9, 10, 11, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all, right there, black ink on white paper, and if Calvinists just had the capacity to keep reading, okay, there would be no Calvinism. All you got to do, you want to you wanna overcome Calvinism? We just put out a video a couple days ago, I think yesterday, one of our short videos, one of our clips. Um, the cure for Calvinism. Keep reading. People just keep reading. You cure some Calvinism fast. So uh, the Jews are being hardened in Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 11, but Israel... Which followed, not, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Well, my people Israel, okay, is the same ones he shall save his people from their sins, and Israel, my people Israel, uh, hath not attained the law of righteousness. Why? Because they had an eternal decree of reprobation. Says no Bible you ever found anywhere in any language, any translation, ever. Okay? It says, because they sought it not by faith, but, as it were, by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. That's why, not because there was an eternal decree of reprobation. And, in fact, these people, as we'll see in a minute, are still the elect, even though they are enemies of the gospel, which is one of the big clues we find that elect has very little, if anything, to do with salvation. It has to do with service being ser serving in a certain capacity and future blessing and israel are the same people his people are the same ones that are blinded in romans eleven twenty five. for i would not brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to israel until the fullness of the gentiles be come in now these same people his people my people israel he shall save his people from their sins. In the same context, my people Israel, who were his own but did not receive him, who were hardened and blinded, they are referred to as the enemies of the gospel, and they are referred to as the election in the same verse. In the exact same verse and the exact same pericope as Romans 9 through 11. Romans eleven twenty eight. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. There you have people who are the election and enemies of the gospel at the same time. Election does not equal salvation. Two different things. Election is service, and oftentimes it is unsaved gospel rejecting people who are elected to service in certain capacities okay not elected to salvation elected to service two different things get them straight you can be elected for service and fulfill your service and go to hell hello balaam hello the jews who rejected him it happens over and over again in the bible if you just read the bible I have all these passages here when it comes to God being a faithful God, he says he's a faithful God, right? What about all these passages? Who gave himself a ransom for all. I will draw all men to me. Um, uh, the free gift came upon all men to justification of life. In the same verse where the judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Romans 11.32, that he might have mercy upon all. Second Peter 3.9, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 2.1, denying the Lord that bought them, showing you that Christ purchasing someone with the atonement does not save them. The atonement is not what saves. You want to look at what saves, open up your Bible and read it. It says so. 1 John 1.7, that all men through him might believe. 1 John 1.9, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. This is that true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Not some men, not every man, not some men of every kind, doesn't say any of that. Every man that cometh into the world. Hebrews 2.9, that he should taste death for every man. 
1 John 2, 2, he's a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15, that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live, different group, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto them which died for them and rose again. John 1, 29, behold the Lamb of, the God, Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the elect, not what it says, sin of the world. 1 John 4, 14, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, not the Savior of the elect, the Savior of the world. The elect, remember, what are the elect doing? The elect are enemies of the gospel over here, okay? They're enemies of the gospel. You're not going to be an enemy of the gospel and be saved. So the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, not the elect. John 17, 21. I and thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And that's uh, another important one because uh, Calvinists get hung up on John 17, 9, not realizing the chapter is not over there. So the question here would be, same passages, but look at the header up here. Is God faithful to this revelation of himself also? So when Dever is talking about the God of the Bible is a faithful God, he's pointing out just very select things that allow him to maintain his um, Calvinist, his Calvinistic mindset. The Calvinistic overlay. When a Calvinist says God is a faithful God, what they really mean is that they have invented a model of God that is consistent with Calvinism. They do not believe in the God of the Bible, nor do they believe in the God of reality, which the God of the Bible is the God of reality, and they reject that God. They've invented a Zeus, a modified Zeus version of God that is faithful to Calvinism, rather than actually being faithful. Okay, be interesting if the phrase... God is faithful actually shows up in scripture, probably in Lamentation somewhere. But they're constantly pulling phrases out that sound good that actually aren't scriptural. And then when you look at the context of the phrases that actually are in scripture, it's not what they're saying, you know, 99.9 times out of 10. And that, you know, reminds me of the old saying, 99.9% .9 of Calvinists give the rest of them a bad name. So the next quote from Dever here, in fact, both the old and New Testaments teach us that this kingly suffering Messiah is our only hope. Jesus solves the riddle of Exodus 34. I never saw a riddle there, by the way. There's no more riddle in Exodus 34 than there is with water. Okay? He shows how God can forgive our wickedness while at the same time punish the guilty. Just like water can do. whoop de do Okay? So, my comments, riddle, paradox, mystery, there is never such a thing as Calvinists like to present. Now, there are mysteries in Scripture. There are paradoxes in Scripture. There are similitudes in Scripture. There are parables, okay, that are very interesting in Scripture. But Calvinists co-opt the existence of these things in order to cover for their philosophy that contradicts scripture. They want to take where their philosophy contradicts scripture and call that a riddle or a paradox or a mystery. Well, there's no reason to do that. Okay. That's why Calvinists are always talking about the, the tension between this and this. All right. First of all, you have a false dichotomy. They're narrowing your scope of thought to this false dichotomy when there are other options. And then they talk about the tension between these things. And really all they're doing is addressing an unresolved false uh, false dichotomy that they just invented out of thin air. There is no such thing. Thanks for the super chat. Finding the narrative says, appreciate this content, Kevin. Look forward to finishing it later. Well, finding the narrative, uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Help from, help, uh, thank you for making, help making this possible. And then my point is, there is what scripture says and the wrong modeling we humans like and tend to bring to it, which is what Calvinists, provisionists, you know, et al. do. The next quotation of his, at the heart of understanding Jesus Christ is understanding what he came to do. 
He came as the only one by whom you and I can have a restored relationship with God. And my comment is like, you and I? That's quite a leap from his people. If you remember back at his last comment back here, he's talking about his people, his people, his people. Suddenly, he's talking about you and I. Well, how, how do we get there? How do we get from his people, Israel, who are hardened and blinded and enemies of the gospel while being called the election, how do we get from there to you and I unless Jesus Christ is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world, which Calvinists don't believe, unless Jesus did taste death for every man, which Calvinists don't believe, unless Jesus really did die for all, which Calvinists don't believe. Unless Jesus really will draw all men to him, which Calvinists don't believe. Okay? The only way that you and I can be brought in here with a consistent hermeneutic is if all these passages are true. And Calvinists don't believe any of these. I know they say they believe them, but they have post hoc rationalizations for why they don't mean what they say. So, which means they don't believe them. Okay? You want a definition of Calvinism? It's clever post hoc rationalizations for why scripture isn't true. That's your definition of Calvinism. He is the one for, so, uh, yeah. Does Dever know that the person reading this is elect? So what if you have somebody, and when I say elect, I'm talking about in the Calvinist Gnostic sense, not in the biblical sense. Isn't this misleading? Shouldn't he say me and potentially you? When he says, he came as the one by whom you and I can have a restored relationship with God. What if a, a Gnostically non-elect person is reading his book? Can can Dever rightly say that we, you and I, can have a relationship with God? I don't think so. I don't think he can. Okay, so this is a point of dishonesty here. So he's say potentially you. He is the one for whom God's people had long been waiting where Adam and Israel failed had and <clears throat> been unfaithful. Jesus survived temptations without sin. Here was the prophet promised by Moses, the king prefigured by David, and even the divine son of man of Daniel 7. These all came in Jesus of Nazareth. He is the word of God made flesh. He is our prefigured substitute. He is the lamb slain for the sins of his people. Now, he's throwing this lamb slain for the sins of his people. Uh, what about being for the sins of the world? Didn't we just read that? Take away the sin of the world? The lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world? The sin of the world? Where is that? Father sent the son to be the savior of the world? But it's just his people here. See? Slain for the sins of his people. There's this Calvinism coming out. So notice this phrase, he is our prefigured substitute there. Prefigured substitute. This is spoken from the presumption of a transactional categorical sadist God who needs to be placated with someone suffering before he is able to show mercy. Okay? This God is a very beige and purple God that Dever has in mind here. Okay? Very beige and purple God going back to yesterday's session on these timelines. And then, um, Christ, my next comment, Christ didn't die to change God's mind about us. He died to change our minds about him. And of course, this whole, his people thing here, he's narcissistically including himself and the Calvinist Gnostic version of elect people into what Christ had going on. In his, you ever, you ever look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 and 6? Don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If they were his people, how'd they get lost? Jesus, the Son of Man, Luke 19, 10, has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Well, if they were in him from before the foundation of the world, how'd they get lost? So he had to come find them again. I mean, it sounds like a pretty dodgy place to be in Christ if you can keep falling out and need somebody to keep finding you all the time because you keep getting lost. Okay? Calvinism doesn't work. It contradicts itself at every turn. The next comment. Uh, have we moved on? Okay, so now we've moved on from the Bible, from the God of the Bible is a faithful God. Now we are on the God of the Bible is a loving God. 
which is a very strange thing for a Calvinist to say. Notice what they do, though. Closely tied to the idea of God's faithfulness is the fact that he is a God of love with a special love for his covenant people. God made us to, made us to reflect his image. Even the non-elect people reading your book, he made us to be in covenant with him. So notice that, with a special love for his covenant people. Now you may not be able to see this over here, so I'm going to make it bigger for you. I have two Bible searches there. I'm searching the whole Bible for the words special and love being in the same verse. Nope. No special love in the Bible. And then here is the phrase I've searched for covenant people in quotation marks. He says covenant people. This is biblical theology, right? Biblical theology. I did a search for covenant people. Well, guess what I did not find? I did not find the phrase covenant people in the Bible. Where does that come from? Think about that. That phrase covenant people never came from any Bible he ever saw in his life. And there it is, right there in the chapter on biblical theology. This is not biblical theology. Special love. Calvinists always love to, is my comments over here, Calvinists always love to, ha to have, uh, they always have to, they always have to divide God's prerogatives into two to get away from what the text actually says. See the next slide. When we were talking about James White's debate and closing remarks, we went and talked about, we showed how Calvinists constantly do this. Now notice the phrase special love here. Notice what James White does. Notice what all Calvinists do down here at the bottom. To get rid of John 3.16, Calvinism invents two categories of love. They have it, for God so loved the world. Well, now Calvinism says there's a general love and a special salvific love. That's what James White said in his closing remarks. But you notice there's no Bible verse that talks about the difference between God's general love and God's special love? It's not there. Why do Calvinists talk about that? Because they don't believe John 3.16. So they have to divide God's love into two different kinds of love so that they can say that the love there is not the real kind that we need that actually results in people getting saved results in Christ dying for people. No, Christ didn't actually die for them. No, no, God didn't love the world. He had a general love for the world while hating most of them enough to send them to hell. You know, because after all, God hated Esau and he hates these people and he's sending them to hell. And that's God's general love is to hate people. That's, that's Calvinism. Now, they're not going to say that, but to deny that that's the logical consequence of Calvinism is gaslighting. That is the logical consequence of Calvinism. And there's no way around that. So what are they going to do next? Um, when it comes to God's will, what do they do? They divide God's will into two different kinds of will. I don't like it when 1 Thessalonians 4.3 talks about the will of God. This is the will of God that ye abstain from fornication. Well, what about the guy who committed fornication back in 1 Corinthians 5.5? 5? Calvinists would say that is the decretal will of God, but this is the preceptive will of God. Well, it doesn't say it's the preceptive will of God to abstain from fornication. It says this is the will of God to abstain from fornication. Calvinists have to invent two different kinds of the will of God because they don't believe what the text says. See, when the guy in 1 Corinthians 5 commits fornication, I can very clearly say it was not the will of God for him to do that. Calvinists don't believe the text, though. And I have the authority of Scripture behind me when I say that. Calvinists don't believe the text. And they will say, well, it was the decretal will of God for him to do it, but the preceptive will of God for him to not do it. So now God is Schmeagel and Gullum. Congratulations. Creating a God after your own image turns out that it does not work out too well. Calvinism has to modify grace. They don't believe grace in the Bible. So what do they come up with? They have to have sovereign grace. 
irresistible grace, prevenient grace, yes, Arminianism is Calvinism, common grace, doctrines of grace, every, every kind of grace you can think of except the grace that's actually in Scripture. The Bible has the word call. Okay? There are actually two calls, two kinds of calls, but they are in Scripture. There's a vocational call in Ephesians 4.1, and there's a gospel call in 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Calvinism invents new kinds for their paradigm. They have an inward and outward call. Not any Bible you ever saw, any translation, any version you ever saw in your life. They have a general and a particular call. Not any Bible you ever saw. They have an effectual and a non-effectual call. Not any Bible you ever saw in your life. There's an effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, but there's not an effectual call in the Bible or a non-effectual call in the Bible. No such thing. They have to invent these things because they don't believe what the Bible says. It's that simple. So you need to know this about Calvinism. Calvinism is a giant word game. They don't believe what the text says, so they have to constantly play with the words, which is one of the artifacts. One of the artifacts of... Huh. Where are we? Having monopoly money beliefs. When all your beliefs are tied up in fake monopoly money words that don't point to anything real, you can play with those words all day long. You can just invent words. It's like printing money. Oh, it says the will of God? I don't believe that. Let's create two different kinds. Let's print money. Let's have the decretal will and the preceptive will. Let's just print it. See? propositional knowing doesn't mean anything doesn't point to anything real doesn't reflect what the bible's saying oh grace ah i have a problem with that that goes against my ideology let's print money let's come up with new kinds of grace let's come up with prevenient grace and irresistible grace and sovereign grace and doctrines of grace but every every grace but what's what are they doing they're printing money okay if you have real money, you can buy a house or a car with it. If you have monopoly money or if inflation has gone so bad, you can't, it doesn't point to anything. If your money doesn't point to any goods and services, it's not really money. It's not currency. You can't buy anything with it. Okay? Calvinist words, propositional knowledge is the currency of the four kinds of knowing. And it must point to one of the other three kinds of knowing in order for it to be real, in order for it to be actual knowing. Propositional knowing, when used correctly, is good. But the problem with proposition-only types of theology, which is what Calvinism slash provisionism is, is that you can just invent new words that have absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about. And what you have is a system that is semantically, semantically disambiguated to allow for the system at the propositional level only. Right there. Right there. <laughs> Right there, at the propositional level only, it's, sem it's semantically disambiguated there. Oh, we don't like the will of God. Let's invent two different kinds. Let's get the decretal will and the perceptive will. That is them semantically disambiguating the contradiction caused by the statement in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, that this is the will of God, even for your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication. Well, if that means that... The fornication in 1 Corinthians 5 is not the will of God, but I have a doctrine which says it was the decretal will of God. What am I going to do with that? I have to print money. I have to come up with new kinds of words. I have to, I have to make two different kinds of the will of God. Now I've got two wills of God. Text doesn't have two wills of God. They have two wills of God. This is why it's important to understand the four kinds of knowing. And this is why it's important to understand when somebody is doing quantitative easing with your words, which is all Calvinism is. It's, that's why there's so much word inflation. It's because they're constantly printing money that doesn't point to any goods or services. doesn't point to anything real. Right? If you can take some real simple statements in the Bible, this is the will of God, and you want to tell me you got a doctrine with so much technical debt that it's actually not the will of God. It's a different kind of will of God. Or this is, yeah. You got problems. You got problems. So Calvinism is, is an attack on the language. And while 
propositional knowing by itself leads to this kind of thing. That's the problem with it. See, I don't have a problem with propositional knowing. People think I have a problem with propositional knowing. I don't have a problem with it at all. I have a problem with the inflation that comes along with proposition only knowing. And this is an example of it. All the word games that exist in Calvinism, they create a system. They create an entire system that exists completely independent, has absolutely no correspondence with reality whatsoever. And so to their little puny finite minds, which think highly of themselves, they think the system, oh, it's so perfectly worked out. It's no contradictions. It's logical. It's the most illogical thing I've ever heard of in my life. It is the most illogical thing that's out there. It's not logical at all. It doesn't make any sense. And you had to create and invent a whole new set of little word games and equivocations. Wait till they get you on a not by works. Guess what not by works means in proposition land? It actually means not by faith. It means regeneration precedes faith. That's what not by works means to a Calvinist. Why? Because they rely on proposition only knowing. Knowledge puffeth up and it doesn't point to anything real. So none of the phrases in Calvinism actually mean anything. The word sovereign actually means like a king would have control over his country. It does not mean divine meticulous determinism over every molecule. But it does to them. Why? Because words mean nothing in a system that is a house of cards. It is built completely out of semantically disambiguated words with nothing correspondence with experiential reality whatsoever at all. It's completely made up. It is worse than Dungeons and Dragons, okay? It is just as stupid and silly as people staking their lives on Dungeons and Dragons LARPing. That's exactly what Calvinism is. It's not any better than that, except it is more profane than that. Now he says, for his covenant people, next part of his quote here, his covenant people. This is like a child pretending to be something that they aren't. His covenant people. And of course, <laughs> of course, I am one of those covenant people. I am, I am one of those covenant people. Of course he is. Of course he's one of the covenant people. It's Narcissus. Um, our mid-Acts friends, Justin Johnson was on. They observe that there isn't, any, there isn't a covenant that applies to the Gentile body. The new covenant, all oh, that's always about Jews. The covenants are all with Israel. Us. Dever, he says, God made us to reflect his image. Dever jumps from covenant people straight to us. This is a sophomore hermeneutical mistake. An oversight, a gloss. This confuses interpretation for application, which is ironic to occur in a chapter that advocates for quote-unquote biblical theology. So who is the us? Dever validated that the us is constituted of elect people. <laughs> or has. That's a question. I'm asking a question there. Has Dever, Mark Dever, the, the author here, has Mark Dever validated that the us is constituted of the elect people? And when I elect in the Calvinist agnostic sense, not in the biblical sense. They also have this uh, replacement theology going on. Revelation 2.9 says... I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. And that's where people who hold to replacement theology fall. Yeah, someone says, yes, Kevin, they hold themselves in high esteem. And GMW said Calvinism cosplay. Yep. <laughs> LARPing, live action role play. Calvinism, provisionism, it's, it's Dungeons and Dragons for people who outgrew Santa Claus but need to replace them with something. So on this next one, I have the comments here and then I have my comments on the next page. So I'm going to read his comments first. Reading Dever's book. So how could the Lord forgive wickedness and yet not leave the guilty unpunished? The answer, as we saw earlier, is found in Jesus. He is the one who, though not guilty himself, took on our guilt and was punished for it. Our guilt? Uh, I'm not disagreeing with this, but he's not establishing any hermeneutical basis for saying these, making these statements. He's, he's making an application when he should still be dealing with meaning. This is what Jesus taught his disciples in Luke 24, where he says, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. 
Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what was written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name in all nations beginning in Jerusalem. What he doesn't tell you is back in Luke chapter 18 when he tried to talk about the death, burial, and resurrection coming up, they understood none of these things. Even though they are the chosen, they are elect. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And they understood none of those things. No Gnostic uh, knowledge infusion there. Uh, this is what is written. His comments. This is what the Lord had prophesied that he would show his love to his people in a very particular way. Okay. So Calvinists believe that Christ only died for the elect. So this, this funny wording here, these little phrases show his love to his people in a very particular way that comes from Calvinism doesn't come from the Bible. That's him glossing over, you know, take away the sin of the world for God so loved the world. They don't believe that. Okay. He says, remember the famous prophecy from Isaiah 53, surely who took upon our firmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, uh, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is what Christ did in his love, as he taught his disciples, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Paul too described Jesus Christ Jesus as the one, and then he's quoting now Philippians 2, 6-8, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance of man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, 6-8 from whatever version he's quoting from. And then he says, On the third day Christ rose again, and his disciples, filled with the Holy Spirit, began to preach. In this first Christian, ser Christian sermon, Peter said, Now listen, first Christian sermon. Men of Israel. Now there's his own special people that he loved in his own particular way. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know, this man was handed over to you by God, set up purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of the wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. In the New Testament, we find then that God keeps all of his promises because of his covenant love for his people, and we are Christians today because it is God, because God continues to keep those promises. Uh, this Acts 22, God keeps all of his promises because of his covenant love for his people. Again, down here, you may not see it, but I put it over here. I did another search for covenant love. And guess what? Covenant love. It's not a Bible phrase. This is a chapter that is supposed to be biblical theology. Covenant love for his people. Covenant love. Not a Bible phrase. Not a thing. Again, word games. Let's print money, quantitative easing. Let's just make up whatever we want. This is not biblical theology. So my comments from the previous slide are, under the guise of God is a loving God, the Calvinist author takes every opportunity to drive home the concept of the uniqueness of his people leading to their version of the elect, which of course they are the elect, of course. This is a self-centered, narcissistic way to see oneself into every aspect of scripture and to make the self special regardless of the text and what it's actually about. What the text is actually about. The main, th the main theme of Scripture and who, uh, huh. the main theme of Scripture is dominion and who's got dominion. What's the first thing that happens to Adam and Eve? You're going to have dominion over the earth. You're going to have dominion, Noah. You're going to have dominion. Finally, Solomon has dominion. And then when it gets to the times of the Gentiles, Nebuchadnezzar gets dominion. The theme of the Bible is who's got dominion. The idea is that dominion will always be subpar, never be as good as it could be, until, un, until or unless the main subject of the Bible, Jesus Christ, is the one who has the dominion. Okay. Main theme of the Bible is dominion, who's got it. And the main subject of the Bible is Jesus Christ. Okay? But in Narcissism Calvary Land, 
They wear the lenses of the redemptive historic method of interpretation, thinking that everything is about them. Which presumes the preeminence of the objects of redemption instead of the subject of redemption. In scripture, redemption is only one aspect of the story. And Christ, not Calvinist egos, is in the spotlight. But in Calviland, Calvinist egos are in the spotlight. It's all about us. We're the elect people. It's all about the redemptive historic method. And we're just glad that we're part of it. Of course you are. His comment from the last page, he said, And if we are Christians today, it's because God continues to keep those promises. That sounds so sweet it's sanctimonious and it's moralistic, but it is a far cry from biblical theology. Let's look at why these people are Christians down here. Acts 17, 11 through 12. These were more noble than those of Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. In other words, because of this, therefore, Many of them believe. Why do they believe? Why do they become Christians? Because of this. That's what the text says. Why do some people believe and some people don't? Bam! Right there. Acts 17, 11. Read it for yourself. It's up to you if you choose not to believe Scripture. That's what the Bible says. That's just what it says. Therefore, many of them believe. That's why they believe. Because of that. <clears throat> this is one of the charts that I like to... Um, show on a regular basis because it shows what scripture says over here and it shows what Calvinists believe over here. Okay. Calvinists don't actually, when it comes to the love of God, okay. Calvinists actually don't believe what scripture says. And the proof of this, they will object. To, like if you show a Calvinist, this version of Romans five, two over here, but don't tell them where you got it and don't tell them it's misquoted. They will think it's true. Like if you show them that version of it, but leave all the text black, show them that version of it and say, what's wrong with this? They won't be able to tell you why, because they believe the one on the right. Okay. If you show them these verses, they will be able to say, oh, I don't believe that because it's not scripture, but they can't tell you what lie it teaches. So I have this down here proof. A Calvinist cannot explain to you what false doctrine or error is taught in the renderings on the right hand column. In the right hand column, nor can they tell you where or how to avoid it. So if these are false, Mr. Calvinist, what kind of church do I need to go to that is not going to teach those things? Because that's what Calvinism teaches. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says this stuff over here. Calvinism teaches this. It's two different things. So, Mr. Calvinist, what errors do these teach? Not, not they're just wrong because they're not scripture, but content-wise, what errors, do, what lies do they tell? And how can I avoid those lies? And what church would I need to go to in order to avoid those lies? That's the question to you, Calvinist, okay? I'm thinking about doing a video soon on Romans 9, and in one column I will have the Bible, and in the next column I will have it altered to match what Calvinists believe. Go through Romans 9 that way to show the difference between Scripture and what Calvinists think it says when they look at it and what a lot of non-Calvinists are tricked into thinking it says when they look at it as well. They say the God of the Bible is a loving God. Here's his next quotation. <clears throat> what does it mean to become part of God's covenant people? Do you ever hear anybody, you know in Acts 16.30, the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? Does anybody ever ask, what, what, what must I do to become God, part of God's covenant people? They might have asked that before Acts 15, but there's no biblical record of it. Part of God's covenant people to be a Christian. Okay, Now we've already shown, we've already demonstrated that this phrase, covenant people, is not a Bible phrase. Why are you interested in becoming covenant people when there is no phrase covenant people in the Bible? Why? Where does that come from? See, it doesn't come from the Bible. It comes from something else. It comes from you. And this, is, this is what Calvinists are very famous for, infamous for, and they're slick at doing this. They're, the reason they sound funny when they talk is they're trying to promote something without coming out and saying it. 
They're trying to promote unconditional election and the other points of the tulip without coming out and actually saying them. Okay? That's why you get this strange phrasing, these really weird phrases that you never say, that you never see in Scripture. Part of God's covenant people to be a Christian. And what you don't get. <laughs> and then like James Ross at First Baptist Church on Bayshore in Niceville, Florida. <laughs> he, he, he'll be preaching and he'll say, you need to find yourself in Christ. What does that phrase mean? Where'd you ever find that phrase in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. And these guys boast. They boast about how biblical their theology is. I can't complain about what this... I just, I just have to preach it because it's a Bible. I don't have a choice whether to believe it. I just have to accept it because it's what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say anything about find yourself in Christ. The Bible doesn't say that. You made that garbage up to try, because when they say stuff like that, find yourself in Christ, because in their theology, in their soteriology... They believe that regeneration precedes faith. There's actually nothing you can do to be saved. You don't believe on Christ. You don't do anything. There's, there's no part you play at all. Of course, we could talk about the hearing of the gospel because they always overlook that, which makes them synergists, by the way. Unless God's holding a gun, someone's holding a gun to their head, making them listen. They're willingly cooperating by listening, but that's another story. But they see they re, they believe in that regeneration precedes faith. So if someone comes up to them and they're like, "What must I do to be saved?" Of course they would probably quote Acts sixteen thirty one because they know that they're supposed to. But in reality, they would say some nonsense like, "You need to find yourself in Christ," which is what James Ross says from the pulpit. And we've played the sermons on this channel of him saying that from the pulpit. Where do you get that in the Bible? So when Calvinists are talking funny like this. It's because they're trying to promote something from Calvinism without coming out and saying it. That's what they're doing. They got a little funny theology. You ever find yourself listening to a sermon? It's just like, it just becomes like theological gobbledygook and your eyes just glaze over and you're like, what on earth am I listening to? It's because they're using propositional knowledge to dance around something that they're not coming out and saying it with all this flowery biblical biblical sanctimonious sounding language that's not biblical language there's no covenant people is not a bible phrase okay but they, they, this religious sounding language it's called tiptoeing through the tulips they're trying to preach the tulip th to you without preaching the tulip to you that's what they're <coughs> that's what they're trying to do so he says what does it mean to be part of god's covenant people to be a christian he equates those two which a mid acts dispensationalist that we've had on the channel, they would not equate those two. So what, where, how far should we look down that rabbit trail? What happens when someone becomes a Christian? Is it simply a matter of making a decision? Is it a matter of praying a prayer? Or do we need to repent? Do we need to believe? If we do repent and believe, how is it that we're able to do that? If we're as bad as Scripture says we are, remember the false dichotomies we were talking about yesterday? How bad are we? Okay? If we're as bad as Scripture says we are, if we are dead in our sins and transgressions, how do we all of a sudden repent and believe? What is he doing here? Regeneration precedes faith and total depravity. That's what he's saying without coming out and saying it. Okay? He's using syllogistic reasoning, like we talked about yesterday, to say things without saying them. To try to, pro, to try to put two pieces of the syllogism together and have you come up with a third part. All men are mammals. Kevin is a man. Therefore, and then you're thinking Kevin is a mammal. The syllogism's like that. So he's coming out and laying out the syllogistic parts of his sophistry without tying the little bow on the end. You're supposed to do that. You see? This is, this is what's called sophistry. Asking these kinds of questions. These are not questions like Socrates would ask. These are questions like sophists would ask. Okay? He, these are questions. He, see, he already has the goal. He already has the uh, um, regeneration precedes faith, irresistible grace, and unconditional election and total depravity. He already has that in mind. And when he asks these questions, he's getting to that. He's not genuinely asking open-ended questions trying to adduce a new insight out of you that he's never heard before, which is what genuine wise interaction in Upaya does. No, he, this is sophistry. He's already got the conclusion in mind. 
He's trying to lead you to it. That's the opposite of wisdom. That's why we have no wise elders in evangelical Christianity, because of the garbage like this. Nonsense, seventh grade, sophomore garbage. And I know sophomores are in the 10th grade. <clears throat> so he says, how do we all of a sudden repent and believe? Of course, implying that you can't. Ultimately, our repentance and belief has more to do with God than with us. There's regeneration precedes faith. There's total depravity. There's irresistible grace. All right there. So that's, he's saying those things without coming out and using those labels is all he's doing here. All right. It's, um, you know, a, a clever seventh grader could do it better than this. The reality of our salvation must show us something very important about God. As John wrote, this is love. Not that we loved God, but he, that he loved us. And gave himself for us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We love because he first loved us. First John 4, 9, 10, and 19. So many other things he did not quote from First John. Like what? First John 4, 14. Father sent the son to be the savior of the world. First John 2, 2. He's a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's all in the same book right there. Same book, same author. This is that true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Same author. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Same author that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Same author. The God of the Bible is a God of amazing love. Actually, the Calvinist God hates a majority of people to the point where he sends them to hell. And if you listen to a Calvinist preach, they will... Cite verses like Psalm 5.5, 5, God hates all the workers of iniquity, and, he's, and God hates Esau, and they build this up to where this loving God of the Bible actually hates a majority of humanity and has condemned them to hell. A priori, from before the foundation of the world, equal ultimacy, and because of the way this guy talks, he has promoted the idea of the best of all worlds, Piperism. This guy is, this guy is a seven-point Calvinist which means he believes in equal ultimacy, which means he believes in double predestination, which means before the foundation of the world, uh, God condemned more than half the people to hell completely arbitrarily with absolutely nothing that they did or didn't do having anything to do with that. That's what they believe. And then they want to say this is love? That's love? That's gaslighting. That's what that is. That's toxic. That means your language means nothing. That's what that means. If that's love... The word love means nothing. That's the problem. That's the problem with proposition only knowing. None of the words mean what they actually mean. And none of them point to anything real. Love, Calvinist love is hate. Like one of my atheist friends always says, there's no hate like Christian love. The God of the Bible is amazing. So my comment down here, it's very ironic that the smuggling in of Calvinist not Calvinist agnostic concept of regeneration precedes faith appears in a chapter about biblical theology. This is a chapter about biblical theology. Look how much he's leaving out in a chapter called biblical theology. Here I have a uh, a meme there. They put R.C. Sproul's face on this meme. Calvinists trying to explain how Cornelius received the Spirit of Christ before he received the Spirit of Christ. And this is actually right on the money <laughs> this is actually this is exactly how it goes down we've pointed out many times that we have a whole video uh the cornelius conversion narrative disproves calvinism if you look at uh cornelius he was a devout man one that feared god with all his house which gave much alms to the people and prayed to god always so when you try to talk to a calvinist about this guy uh, they will say things like, oh, he must have already been regenerated or he won't be, wouldn't be doing that. Or he was being drawn or God had given him ears to hear. Scripture never says any of that. These are all post hoc rationalizations of their paradigm over and above Scripture. And when confronted with the biblical narrative accounts of conversions, Calvinists will often invent on the spot post hoc rationalizations that equate to regeneration occurring before the God-ordained means of regeneration have even transpired and will even make regeneration a multi-phased process that starts long before a person hears the gospel. What's the God-ordained means? According to Calvinism, from their own websites, the God-ordained means, people say, I don't quote Calvinists. Here you go. 
The God-ordained means of evangelism is his own word. It's through the proclamation of God's word that the Holy Spirit effectually works faith in men's hearts. The specific message of evangelism is the gospel. Well, when we go back to Cornelius, guess what? He hadn't heard the gospel yet. And so I've had Calvinists tell me, well, he was saved under the old covenant. Well, the, well then why does he need to hear this gospel if he is already saved? Okay? But second of all, we know that's a lie because under the old covenant, they got circumcised because that is the big controversy that this leads up to, whether or not you have to be circumcised. And in chapter 11, which comes right after chapter 10, for those of you who are trying to keep up, Peter gets scolded for going to somebody's house who is uncircumcised. What does that mean? Cornelius is not a proselyte. He is not a proselyte. He's not a Jew. Okay? He is an unclean person with whom Peter ordinarily would not be allowed to fellowship. And that's why he has the vision of the sheet coming down with all the unclean animals on it. Because Cornelius is as Gentile as Gentile gets. Uncircumcised Gentile, not following the first. So every post hoc rationalization they come up with is proven wrong in the text or completely doesn't appear in the text. They will try to say things like, oh, he got ears to hear before. Um, in Acts 10, 6, the angel says, Peter's going to tell you were, he's going to tell you what you ought to do. In the retelling, it says, he's going to tell you in, in chapter 11, retelling the same story, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and thy house shall be saved. So he is unsaved as of chapter 10, verse 6. Very clearly unsaved at that point. We find out from these other passages that he gets saved in chapter 10, verse 43. How do we know that? Because his salvation is tied to that in the next chapter, Acts eleven fifteen 15 through 16. And then they have this big revelation, Acts eleven eighteen. 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance to life. Meaning he's not a proselyte, not a Jew. Because in Acts chapter 2, verse 10, Jews and proselytes, not Jews and Gentiles. If somebody was a Gentile who was a convert to Judaism, they are called proselytes, not Gentiles. Okay? Or sometimes they're called Grecians, Hellenistas, who are proselytes. Called Gentiles here. Different thing. And then also, I don't have this verse on here, but in chapter 11, he's also called uncircumcised. Okay? And then in, in F Acts 15, they're trying to decide whether or not people have to be circumcised and keep the law in order to be saved, or whether or not you can get saved without that. And Cornelius is the example. He is the example that they use. And the example gets turned around to where it's Jews will be saved even as they are. It put no difference between us Jews and them Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. In other words, not circumcision or the deeds of the law, which is what the controversy is about. Context is everything. I know context and Calvinism never go together. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved even as they. And the grace of the Lord Jesus is that it's not like supernatural, irresistible grace. It's the fact that you don't have to keep the law anymore. We, Jews, shall be saved even as they, Gentiles. In other words, Cornelius reset the precedent for how people get saved, Jew or Gentile, starting there, moving forward. That was probably all that way going all the way back, but they just didn't know it till then. And this was an event sent by God to teach them this truth. Action comes before proposition. You see, these propositions are pointing at, people ask me all the time, well, the Bible is full of propositions. But these propositions, you see, they are pointing at something that was participatorily and perspectively and procedurally experienced by people. Making them real and correspond with reality. Unlike the propositions we find in Calvinism that are just a bunch of word games. Now we've finished, we finished, uh, what do we finish? The Bible, God of the Bible is a loving God, which is gaslighting coming from a Calvinist. They actually don't believe that at all. Now let's do the last one. Let's try to wrap this up. What time is it? I have to go live at, in one hour. Not live. I'm going on a Zoom. Our FSI folks are going on a Zoom in one hour. That's going to be offline tonight. Uh, so I got one hour and I don't want to take up that much time. Let's see if we can handle the, the sovereignty stuff uh, with some time to spare before we have to go.
He says, finally, we find that God is a sovereign God and that in his sovereignty, all of creation is to be involved in his renewing love. All of creation? What about the ones he's sending to hell? What about renewing love for them? This inclusiveness to be involved in his re all of creation? This inclusiveness is performatively contradictory to the very exclusive nature of Calvinism. Look at what John Calvin said. John Calvin said, in his own words, All things being at God's disposal and the decision of salvation or death belonging to him, he orders all things by his counsel and decree in such a manner that some men are born devoted from the womb to certain death, that his name may be glorified in their destruction. That's the wonderful love of God and all of creation is going to be involved in his renewing love uh, because they're devoted from the womb to certain death that God may be glorified in their destruction. You see how wonderful that is? See how wonderful their God is? Of course he is. It's gaslighting, folks. It's gaslighting. It's saying one thing while believing the other one, then they call you crazy like you don't understand Calvinism when you put two and two together. His, <clears throat> his next quotation. The prayer Jesus taught his disciples roots their faith firmly in the rule and reign of God whose will should be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever wondered what that means? Now, why would anybody need to pray for this if everything that came to pass was already determined by God? Matter of fact, I have... Yeah, I'm going to send myself... <laughs> I, I have to put this on here. There is a... A picture meme that I just have to show you. And so I'm going to have to bring it on here. But in God's, the London Baptist Confession, okay, in chapter three of the London Baptist Confession, paragraph one, it says, God hath decreed in himself from all eternity by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably, all things whatsoever comes to pass. So why would anybody in that situation need to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Why would anybody need to pray in that situation if that's what's coming to pass? Lord, I am unchangeably decreed by you to pray that you unchangeably maintain what you have unchangeably decided from eternity past. Amen. Calvinist prayer. I'll take a screenshot of that. Let me get bigger. Make it bigger like this. So you can take a screenshot of that. And anytime somebody tells you that Calvinists pray, and they'll say, like, why do Arminians pray? Of course, they don't know the difference between, they don't know that Arminians are Calvinists. So take a screenshot of that and make sure you share it with folks <laughs> whenever they talk about prayer and Calvinism. Because if Calvinism is true, then prayer is an absolute farce and there is absolutely no reason for it. It is, somebody said in the comments, Lolasaurus Rex said, Calvinistic prayer is virtue signaling. The, the only reason Calvinists pray and evangelize is because they know that Christians pray and evangelize because we actually have reasons to. And the only reason they pray and evangelize is to fool other Christians that they are also Christians. It's the only reason they do it. And when they tell you that like... The, why would anybody who's not a Calvinist pray for the lost? I'm like, that's also gaslighting. There's no reason to pray for anybody for any reason if Calvinism's true. And the only reason to pray for anybody for anything at all is if Calvinism isn't true. He says, going on to his other comments, I gotta move along here. <laughs> J. Romang says, Lord, you're this and I'm that. Amen. Calvinist prayer. Carrying on with the, his quotations. Some people limit their hopes very deliberately to today, to things they can promise and fulfill in their own power and their own strength. <clears throat> things they know they can be certain of. They don't want to set their hearts on anything else. Are y'all hearing the false dichotomy here? He's setting up a false dichotomy. He's setting up something to oppose himself against rather than be in explore mode. He's in Arizona. He's not in New Orleans. Okay. <laughs> they don't want to see their, they don't want to set their hearts on anything else. They've been burned too many times. So they're cynical. They're not going to put their trust in some promise whose fulfillment they cannot 
guarantee, but Christianity has never been like that. Christians have always had a hope that extends beyond ourselves and exceeds what we could ever do in our own power. And you don't realize this, but this will lead you to nihilism. What we could ever do in our own power. Peter wrote, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of the righteous. What about the godliness that is profitable for the, the life that now is and that which is to come? What about that one? Peter wrote, we are looking forward to a new heaven and new earth. This points to the fulfillment of the final and first hope of the Bible, the first the hope of the whole world being put right as God's sovereign plan extends from Christ to his covenant people to creation itself. And this, I'm, the way he's using covenant people and God's sovereign plan, it sounds like Handmaid's Tale. It sounds terrible. It sounds like a witch coven. It sounds like people sitting around in robes saying words that don't mean anything. It's, it's like a Dungeons and Dragons kind of handmaid's tale kind of thing it's weird the the language is weird okay you don't find this stuff in the bible you don't find anybody talking like that god's sovereign plan sometimes it isn't so this is a false dichotomy the premise is a false dichotomy that either you're going to accept his his version of god's sovereignty or you're completely relying on yourself that's the false dichotomy that he's setting up Cynicism versus superstition and magical thinking. Okay, he's got that's hit. That's what he just set up. Cynicism is all this up here. All right, and what he's got going on is superstition and magical thinking, which is purple. <clears throat> it's purple. We say, what do you mean that's purple, Kevin? That is, um, when we were back here, it's purple thinking. What he just set up there is purple thinking. This is one of the reasons I want you to get familiar with growth models, developmental models, consciousness level models. I want you to get familiar with the, these kinds of things so that when people talk this way, you can spot where they are on the developmental meter. Okay, it's very important to, to grasp that. It's very helpful too. Um, he does not pre present any interactive agency or attunement. I'm going to show you some passages of scripture in a second. This precipitates nihilism. What this does, what he is presenting does, it presents people who feel like they are completely helpless, like every bit of agency that can change the world for the better exists in some other realm, some godly, angelic, spiritual realm to which they don't have access and they just have to pray and they're at the complete mercy of God to sovereignly intervene in their life and do something and make something better and nothing that they can do matters. That's what it results in. I know they're not going to preach that, but I'm telling you, that's the unintended consequence. Okay? That's the unintended consequence. John 14, 12. Here's the Bible, though. Here's some Bible for you. Let's, let's see what the Bible has to say about it. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he, the works that I do, he shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. In other words, the people that are still here on this planet are going to do greater works than what Jesus did. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Now we're going to talk about that in just a second. Ephesians 2.10, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, which is uh, the Bible interpreting itself for Ephesians 1.4, by the way. But we're actually supposed to be doing things. We're not supposed to be either cynical or completely sit back and like learn helplessness, which is what this guy is teaching without, he would never admit to that, but that's what he's teaching, learned helplessness. Philippians 2, 12 through 13, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It doesn't say work for your salvation. Work it out. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that in a second. For it's God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure in this mortal flesh, 2 Corinthians 4, while you are on this earth. Okay? There was a guy who single-handedly carved a road through a mountain to help his village. For years he was called a madman for toiling away on the rocks. But Dashrath Manji was not crazy. His quest to break a path through a small mountain to benefit the entire village was now legendary because he carved an entire road with hand tools, working for 22 years, 
Manji started off his extraordinary task in 1960 after his wife was injured while trekking up the side of one rocky one of the rocky footpaths to reach the nearest hospital. He had to travel around the mountains some 70 kilometers. Okay? The laborer from Gelor Hills in Bayar, India, wanted his people to have easier access to doctors, schools, and opportunity. Armed with only a sledgehammer, chisel, and a crowbar, he single-handedly began carving a road through the 300-foot mountain that isolated his village from the nearest town. He toiled from 1960 to 1982, Having developed his own technique, he burned firewood on the rocks, then sprinkled water on the heated surface, which cracked the boulders, making it possible to reduce them to rubble. Finally, the road was completed with sides 25 feet high. The road is 30 feet wide, 360 feet in length. Because of this singular dedication, the distance to public service was reduced from 70 kilometers to just one. Okay? So, Matthew 21, 21, Jesus says... If he shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and thou cast it into the sea, it shall be done. And what I'm trying to say to you is sometimes that might take you 22 years. But that's faith. That's faith and altruistic commitment to other people. Okay? Take, voluntarily adopt responsibility for something that is not your fault. Endure the cost of that responsibility and then have a resurrection cycle where as a result you make things a lot better for a lot of other people. Okay? That's what happened there. The God, he says, um, Dever goes on, our understanding of what the Bible teaches, and you know how that phrase makes me sick. This is propositional tyranny. Left hemisphere, like the Bible is a theology answer book. This is the wrong disposition. Okay? This is an in-group requirement to toe the line. So what the Bible teaches about God is crucial. When the Bible says things, it doesn't teach things. You need to get that. Because when someone says the Bible teaches things, think of that propositional knowledge. They're thinking that it is giving you words that it can be semantically disambiguated, which you can then play with. God teaches these things. No. The Bible says things. It's up to you to see how those correspond with reality in an applicable way that is relevant to your life. Okay? You have to apply. And it doesn't, it doesn't teach any particular thing necessarily it provokes to application. So there isn't like one thing that any particular passage teaches. So you've got to be very careful of phrases. We, you don't realize how limiting that phrase is and how left hemispheric and how propositionally limiting, propositional tyranny, that one phrase is what the Bible teaches, okay? Never say it that way. Never say it that way. Don't do that. I see people in emails, I know people in emails who haven't watched all my stuff. Does the Bible teach this? Uh, the Bible doesn't teach things. The rest of the segment on sovereignty will be in part 2D, and it will be posted right after this. We had to end this session because we were losing the frame rate and had to stop the live feed. And so part 2D will be posted and made available right after this one. So go check that out. Thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.